Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be reading The Mask of the Red Death with some annotation and assistance to help you unpack what is happening in this story. The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe was an American writer, editor, and literary critic. Poe is best known for his poetry and short stories, which usually involve mystery and the macabre. In this short story, a wealthy prince holds a party for his powerful friends within the safety of his home, as a disease rips the rest of the country apart. As you read, take notes on how the narrator describes the setting of the story. This story is very rich in symbolism and a lot of that is achieved through color and contrast. Make sure you're paying attention to those as we go through the story. I have also made some highlights and annotations, and I'll be stopping at the end of each paragraph to talk a little bit about the annotations that I made and why I made them. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the, at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men and the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of a half an hour. So this initial paragraph is all about Poe establishing his disease, which is called the Red Death. And if you look back at the title, don't forget from your Romeo and Juliet days, a mask is a party, a big ball. So this is the party of the Red Death the party of the plague, okay? Um, notice the words that he uses to describe the Red Death. It's devastating, fatal, hideous. And notice that it is associated with that color red. Um, red Death, redness of blood, scarlet stains, okay? This is gonna be important. But the Prince Pospero was happy and dauntless and said Jasus. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisor improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. Okay, so in this paragraph, Poe establishes his main character, who is Prince Prospero, as someone who is happy, dauntless, sagacious, um, someone who is not easily cowed or discouraged, someone who loves life and is not going to give in to the Red Death. He also describes the abbey or the castle where Prospero holds his party, 
This is a extensive and magnificent structure with a strong and lofty wall and iron gates. When the courtiers, so the people who are attending the party, when they arrive, they weld the gate shut with bolts to leave neither a way to get in or a way to get out because they are amply provisioned. And so they are going to kind of thumb their noses at this contagion. Everyone else can take care of themselves, but for these elite few, it is not worthwhile to grieve or to think. They have everything they need for security and for pleasure. And the only thing outside is death and the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. So this is where our main plot is kind of introduced. So far, Poe has given us exposition. He's introduced us to our characters, our setting, and the situation with the Red Death, what's happening at this time. Now we're actually getting to the heart of our plot events. Prospero is going to have this mass ball, thus the title, The Mask of the Red Death, where all of his friends will be entertained and party and have a good time. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight, straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here, the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now, in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum. Amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof, there was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of the chambers. But in the corridors that followed, the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that protected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room, and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered, 
that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. Okay, guys. So let's look at this description that Poe gives us of the rooms in which the party is held. This is very important. I know that it's a large paragraph and it's a little overwhelming, but this scene of the party gives us a lot of symbolism that is important to understanding the theme of this story later. So what you have is seven different rooms all kind of connecting through a hallway, if you can envision this. And from the hall, in the hallway, you have a window into each one of the rooms. It's a tall Gothic window, okay? So um, picture kind of a, a, a church stained glass, large, um, floor to ceiling sort of window here that doesn't look out at the outside. It looks in to each room. Okay. These are all stained glass windows and each one is a different color. And for the most part, for six of these seven rooms, the stained glass is the same color as the room is decorated within. And you have a blue room, a purple room, a green room, an orange room, a white room, and a violet room, okay? Now, for those six rooms, these are very upbeat colors, you know, blue, orange, purple, green, um, light, life-like, okay? Um, the seventh apartment, however, is done all in black velvet, okay? So imagine like velvet curtains hanging from the ceiling, down the walls, all the way down to the carpet, which is also a black velvet carpet, okay? Everything in there is black, black midnight velvet, all right? Except this window is not black. This window is scarlet, a deep blood color. Okay, red, red death. If you need to look back at that first paragraph, think about the, sem the symbolism here. What do you associate the color black with? I mean, if you saw someone dressed all in black, where would you assume they might be going? Maybe to a goth party, but more likely to a funeral. This color red, we already have it associated with the disease but it's the color of blood, another color that we associate with death, okay? And then they talk about how in this seventh chamber, the black chamber, that the effect of the red window that the light is coming through and the black in there makes anyone in there, the appearance of anything in there, ghastly in the extreme, it's very disturbing looking. And it makes the faces of anyone who enters look wild. And because of the way people look and the way things look in there, most of the people at the party are not bold enough, are not courageous enough, to go into that room at all, okay? This is important to the rest of the story. Keep this in mind, in mind as we continue reading. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra 
were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound and thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company and while the chimes of the clock yet rang it was observed that the giddiest grew pale and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly and made whispering vows, each to the other, that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. All right, so we get one more detail of that black chamber, the black room in this paragraph. In that black room, there is a clock that is made of ebony. If you don't know what ebony is, the black keys on a piano are carved out of ebony. It's a, it's a type of wood, okay, um, that's black in color. This clock is, you know, like one of those giant old fashioned grandfather clocks, okay? It has a pendulum that swings back and forth to count off each minute, and you get that loud um, kind of tick-tock sound that Poe describes as being dull, heavy, and monotonous as the minute hand moves around the face. And then if you're familiar with those grandfather clocks, each hour they play a tune, they play a chime. And um, it's very loud, deep, and musical. But peculiar is the way that Poe describes it. It catches your attention. In fact, it catches the attention so much that it forces the musicians to stop playing, the dancers to stop dancing, and for everyone to kind of focus on the chiming of the hour every time that it happens. And when they are focused on it, because it is such a strange sound, they kind of lose their, their party attitudes. They get thoughtful, they get worried, they grow a little pale, pass their hands over their foreheads. Um, it kind of makes them stop and reflect for a moment. So give some thought to what we've seen so far, the ideas in this story, and think about how this clock kind of works as a symbol. You know, what do we associate time and um, the passage of time with? How does being forced to think about this, how does this, this passage of time, being forced to pay attention to this clock, the fact that it can't be ignored, how do all of those things work together with the ideas that we've seen of death, life, avoiding disease, how does that all go together to kind of create a theme in this story? Okay, moving forward. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. 
It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. Okay, guys, here we are given a little bit more information about Prospero, our main character. They say that he is peculiar, bold and fiery. Some people would think that he is mad. So he's a little eccentric, a little crazy, a little different and bizarre, okay? The green indicates that you have a question to answer on common lit for your, your guiding questions. So whenever you see that green, that is what that is indicating is that if you go back to your window, you can answer your common lit questions there. He had directed, in great part, the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great feat, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and pequency and phantasm, much of what has been since seen in her nanny. There were arboresque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies, such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then, for a moment, all is still, and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from their tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the darkness of the sable drapery appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal, more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. Okay, in this paragraph, Poe describes to us the scene of the party and the masqueraders, what they look like, how they're dressed. So if you can imagine when he's talking about grotesque, glare, glitter, piquancy, phantasm, arabesque figures, delirious fancies, beautiful, wanton, bizarre, terrible, um, exciting of disgust a multitude of dreams that writhe in and about. What you should be, what Poe is trying to create in your imagination here is sort of a, um, a picture of something that is sort of like a, a carnival or a, um, Mardi Gras sort of an atmosphere where everyone is very is dressed very outlandishly and maybe a little bit um, risque in their appearance. You know, they're they're he he says that there's wantonness. So you know, maybe some of the clothing is a little bit um, a little bit risque and also bizarre and terrible. So if you kind of take that Mardi Gras sort of a glitter and wanton appearance and you add to it like a vampire themed rave or something out of a goth sort of look to get that um, terrible and dis 
terrible and bizarre. You know, it's dark, but also um, very over the top in this uh, kind of wild, fancy. Um, and you've got all of these dancers, which is what the dreams are. The dreams are kind of these dressed up dancers um, writhing about in and out, that sort of thing. And as this is going on, you've got this very party atmosphere with all these people dressed in crazy costumes, dancing about, being a little bit um, wanton and crazy and um, indulging themselves in life. Now, as this is going on, it is occasionally each hour interrupted by the tolling of those of that clock, those chimes. And each time that that clock tolls, so once an hour, all of that party kind of stops, pauses for a minute, and is disrupted by the sound of that of that um, chiming. And each time that another hour passes, those chimes last a little bit longer. And so it has gotten to the point where no one wants to be in the room where that, that clock is. No one is in there at all. And the ones who are closer are to the clock are more and more disturbed by the sound of the, of the clock. But these other apartments were densely crowded and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirling on until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were 12 strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. Okay, so the night progresses in this paragraph. The apartments that are farthest away from the black room have people dancing feverishly with the heart of life and reveling and enjoying their party as has been happening all night until finally you reach the hour of midnight, okay? Hour of midnight, that means 12 um, strokes of the clock or 12 gong chimes. Remember this gong chiming, this chiming of the clock is very disturbing, and now it's going to go on longer than it ever has before. So when that happens, you have people thinking more about death, disease, the, basically all of the things that they're avoiding with this crazy party that Prospero is holding for them. And among the things that happen as people are thinking about that is that they notice a figure that they haven't noticed before, someone that they hadn't paid any attention to. This masked figure is going to be the subject of the rest of our story. You need to pay close attention to this masked figure what he's like, how he's described, 
And notice that as soon as the mask figure is noticed, people start to buzz and murmur. They start to talk to one another. And at first, they are disapproving and surprised, but they then become terrified, horrified, and disgusted by this person who is in their midst. Hopefully you can make a prediction about maybe what this person might look like. Why would they all be so upset about him? In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had outherited Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless, which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seem now deeply to feel that, in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask, which concealed the visage, was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to as assume the type of the Red Death. His vestiture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. Okay. So, here's where we get the description of our masked figure from the last paragraph. Um, hopefully when you made a prediction, if you did at the end of that last paragraph, you might have guessed that he looked like someone suffering from this illness, the Red Death, that's killing everyone outside. And that is what he looks like, okay? He is um, tall and thin. He's in a, it says, shrouded in the habiliments of the grave, which basically means that he was in some kind of a death shroud. You know, like they would bury people in back in post time. And he's wearing a mask that looks like the face of a corpse. And not just of any corpse, but of a corpse of someone who has died from the Red Death. You know, with blood coming out of all its pores, uh, covered in that look of someone who has died from the disease that these people are hiding from okay and poe gives us here some commentary on all of this you know he says that even people who make a joke of everything who who um have kind of a, a dark or macabre sense of humor. Even for those people, there are some lines that you're just not supposed to cross. There are some places where you just go too far. And even though all of the people at this party are kind of thumbing their nose at death, um, laughing at this disease and partying while it's happening and killing people outside of the walls of the castle, this has gone too far for them. Someone dressing up like the corpse of a person who has died from the Red Death is one step over the line. 
And that is why they are all horrified by this. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon the spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. Okay, guys, I've highlighted this paragraph because it's important to the symbolism and the theme of this novel. He is in the blue chamber, the one that is farthest away from the black chamber, okay? So if the black chamber represents death, then the blue chamber is as far away from that as you can get. So whether you, whether you would consider this the room that is the most filled with life or the one that is maybe most filled with um, self selfishness and kind of the ignoring of reality that is where he is when they first see the man who's dressed up like the red death they rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room, where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement to this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker but from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the murmur had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's prison, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step, which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached, in rapid impetuosity, to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterward fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror, at finding the grave crements and corpse-like mask, which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untented by any tangible form. All right, guys, this is an incredibly important paragraph because this is our climax. This is where everything comes to a head and the story gets decided. So Poe kind of takes us back and repeats a little bit what he's been talking about up to this point. We start in the blue room with the prince 
and all of his party goers. And the prince has told everyone that they should grab this masked figure who is dressed up like the Red Death and arrest him for making a mockery of what they are doing here at this party. But everyone is so shocked and horrified and seized with some kind of nameless awe that they can't move, they're paralyzed, and they just stand there as the person who is dressed as the, wet, the Red Death slowly and steadily makes his way out of that blue room into each of the other rooms until finally he reaches the violet room, the one closest to the black room. When he gets to the violet room, Prince Pospero kind of shakes himself and realizes that no one has moved to arrest this man. So he takes up his dagger and runs after the man in the mask and catches up to him when they are both in the black room. So we're in the black apartment now. Prince Pospero is confronting the man dressed up like the Red Death. And when this happens, when the prince gets to the man in the, in the mask of the Red Death, he dies, drops the dagger, dies. And when the prince dies, all of the other party goers come rushing into the black apartment to see what has happened. They find their prince dead. They grab the man who is dressed up like the Red Death. But when they grab him, they find that the robes he is wearing are untented by any tangible form. So in other words, there is no person here. Now, what you want to imagine here is totally up to you. But this is kind of, this man is the Red Death. He is disease. Just like any other disease, you can't see it. It doesn't have a physical form. It's, and so it's not, it's not a real person. And Prince Pospero has died from the disease, okay? Somehow the contagion found its way into what they thought was a safe place, and he is the first one to die from the germs that are there. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood bedewed halls of their revel and died each in the despairing posture of his fall and the life of the black of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay and the flames of the tripods expired and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable domination over all so at the end of their party when the Red Death, when that contagion appears and they realize that the disease is among them, that he had gotten in, and here they're personifying the disease, okay? They've personified death. Death has come. It kills off all of the party goers. Each one of them falls and dies. Eventually, the clock stops ticking as all of the people who were there at the party die. The lights in the fires go out, and they're left with nothing but darkness, decay, and disease that hold dominion over all.
illimitable. So in other words, it can't be stopped, can't be overcome. Death is what is left to all of them. So I hope that my annotations and this um, guided reading will help you to kind of understand the story, some of the symbolism and importance of color and how this illuminates the themes. If you have not done the questions in Common Lit, you will want to go through there and make sure that you stop and do each of the guiding questions that are embedded into the text, then answer your assessment questions at the end.